This is the Shadow Chronicles podcast. We are here to take a deep dive into the inner work, generational trauma and your shadows. Having those hard conversations so you don't have to. You know, all of that shit that just does not get spoken about. In the third drawer down, in the dark, hidden away. My name is Sky and I'm a shadow integration specialist. I am here to help guide you on your journey to unfuck yourself by integrating your shadows, healing the generational trauma so you can vibrate with confidence and just fucking love your life. And my name is Todd, who's an integrative health coach. I help people own more of who they are, change their lives on many different levels to become who they really are. Find your compass and follow it, to say it simply. And welcome to this episode. So if you're following along at home, you've just listened to part one and two of The Shadow of Mum Guilt. And we want to take it one step further. Like we took it pretty far. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> it was, yeah, there's a reason it's a two-parter. <laughs> Oops. Yeah. Um, no. I'm not sorry. <laughs> Neither am I. It was a good convo. But I really wanted to go further on this and really sort of dive into like the reasoning that some people give and this is one thing that I know I received as a child from my own parent of staying in an abusive relationship for the kids, mm. quotation marks. And I want to just put a really caveat on here. This is probably going to be like massive trigger warning, big yellow sign, like, because we're going to touch on some pretty gnarly and sensitive topics here. Of all the episodes we've done so far, this is probably the most worthy of trigger warning <laughs> yes so far so far i know don't worry there's more to come so well with a lot of the work that i do i know that people are waking up i know it's probably not the greatest of terms but it's the one i've got perfectly adequate right a lot of people a lot of women especially are waking up to abusive relationships and then leaving them so we have obviously a, like a very high number of single mums all of that sort of stuff and along with that there's obviously controversy and questions and judgments and all of the fucking things but on the flip side of that so in like previous generations so when I was a child like there was no leaving the relationship it was you stayed together and you had to stay for the kids. Just dealt. And you dealt with whatever you were dealt with. And when I know a lot of like adults now, like myself, have gone back and it's like spoken to their mom or spoken to their dad and it's like, well, why did you fucking stay? You know, you were really unhappy you know, dad was abusive as shit. I can see that. Like, I've come out of it and, like, like why the fuck did you stay? You've caused so much damage to me um, as a child now growing up. I have to, like, fucking heal all these wounds. Mm. And the response is, like, oh, I, I had to stay. I stayed for you. And, like... Mm. like there's, there's two questions I have about this conversation in general. Define abuse for me mm -hmm. because I think the, the line in the sand is different from person to person to person. Yeah. And, and the distinction between what is abuse to one person might be a bit of rough banter to other people sort of thing. Like, mm. so, uh, and I say that to sort of say, like, there's many forms of abuse. It's not just, you know, throwing the backhander and all this sort of stuff. Yeah. As, it's pretty obviously abuse. Yeah. So when I talk about this, I talk more on, I guess, in today's terms would be called, like, big T. So physical abuse, sexual abuse, mm. you know, like, all of those sort of things. The, the, the things that are so clearly and definitively... Abuse. Abuse, yes. As opposed to he called you a bitch once. Yeah, exactly. So and That's not to say that that should be minimised, but that, that's why I'm asking. Mm. Because, you know, telling someone to endure through physical and sexual abuse, it's like, are you high? Yeah. But at the same time, t 
telling someone to endure something that you need to heal and set some boundaries around is like I just wanted to make that the, there's a distinction and you've got to know what you're dealing with before you sort of be able to say, oh, I, I stayed for the kids. Yeah. You know what I mean? Definitely. So, yeah, as you said, there's a complete difference. But like all relationships are designed to trigger. Like we've spoken about so, that yeah. on fucking – Once or twice. You know, maybe mentioned it a couple of times. Nearly every episode. So, as you said, it, it's not a case of, hey, like I'm not agreeing with this behaviour, I don't like this or whatever else, and place those boundaries down – to which then obviously if that person crosses those boundaries, then there is enforcement of those boundaries, whatever that is. It is literally like staying in households where you are black and blue, the children yeah. are black and blue, um, you know, there's things getting thrown, there's things getting broken, you know, like... Bones. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, even like... When you hear the stories of like, oh, he never hit me. He always hit the wall behind, like next to my head or something yeah. like that. And it's just like, well, that's like that's the same fucking Which thing. Is sort of better. <laughs> well, but not, not really. Like, come on. Just so when when we have children growing up in those those households and those situations, and I was one of those. Bec- going into adults is where like those conditioning, that self worth, there's. All of the things come through and they will, like, the nine times a ten, they will step into a relationship that mimics. Exactly that thing. That's your, uh, that's your archetype for mm. masculinity. Th- this is your archetype for femininity. Yeah. This is the role you play out. It's like, well, that makes sense. This is just so ingrained in me now that this is how life goes. Yeah, exactly. And the second question I was going to ask is, is basically that. It's like, h- how much... It's one thing to sort of decide, or what does abuse actually look like to you? Mm. And the other side is, like, did you know any different? Yeah. So we're, we're talking about a scenario that was 30-ish years ago. Yeah. And you're like, <coughs> did they know? Because there's a retrospective assessment mm. of things. It's like, oh, people used to drop N-bombs all the time and it was just what people did. Oh, it's just how people talk sort yeah. of thing. And it's not until you're 50 years down the track and going – well, that's pretty fucked up. Yeah. So th- th- there's that perspective that changes. I, I'm not splitting hairs already. It's only seven minutes in. <laughs> but there's a there's a forgiveness that I think needs to happen on the other side of this conversation as well. Yes. So like sitting with your pain and going, look at all the fucking damage you did for not leaving. Yeah. And. Forgetting that well, they were in it too. Yes. So, and this is an interesting point and one that is a really good discernment as well as just like a, an, a cool level of awareness. So, like as you said, there needs to be a level of forgiveness on the other side of that. And For yourself because that's who it's for. Yeah. yeah. So, I actually, I <laughs> fun fact, I actually don't promote forgiveness anymore. Um, because of the the meaning that is behind a lot of it. So when, I get that. Yeah, when I talk to people about, um, you know, this stuff and, and the healing and all of that sort of stuff and I say the word forgiveness, it, it's because it's been conditioned is like if you forgive that person then you're pretty much you saying – You absolve them of yeah, their Yeah, you absolve them and you have to let them back in your life and all of those sort of things. So um, I actually – I, I call it a purge and I, then I call it like a cutting of the cord or, or a mm. letting go. And that is essentially like it is exactly the same thing. It is letting go of all of the shit that you were hanging on to. Um, you are not absolving that person but that person or those people or whatever the case may be no longer has power over you. So there is that level and the um, – modality for forgiveness is that you know they own they did the best they could with the resources they had available and ultimately it's the forgiveness isn't to absolve them Mm. it's so that you can let it go yeah because it's like it's it's a closure it's a doneness to Mm. it exactly um so I get why you don't use the word. <laughs> like I use it, but I usually qualify it in this frame. Yeah. It's like forgi- you don't have to forgive anyone. No. The forgiveness isn't about that. Yeah. It's not letting them just continue to be that level of bell end. Mm. So step back. This is for you so that you can you can step back. Yeah. 
and when, especially when we're dealing with adults with wounded inner child, mother wounds, father wounds, like all of the things, the minute you say the word forgiveness, that is a massive, can be a massive trigger point or shut down point because that's obviously all they heard and you forgave me so therefore it makes it all okay type thing. Yeah, okay, like it, it's not but like that is why I, I don't actually use that word because then energetically okay. it, it it ends up in shutdown. So when we can reframe it like that, that's how it, we're able to sort of let that go. Also knows that that person doesn't actually have to absolve that person, you know, on all those sort of things. Um, when we talk about the prerequisite for forgiveness, which is, you know, they did the best they could with the resources they had available, mm. there's, there's two levels to that. So one, don't use that as suppression. So, and I, I say that because I did for many years. And I suppressed my angry inner teenager. I suppressed my angry inner child because I walked around going, oh, my mum, she did the best she could with the resources she had available. And it's I, a band-aid. Yeah, I wasn't actually allowing myself to feel the anger, to feel all the things that were associated with the, the wounding that I had to heal. And that was the, you know, abuse that I suffered as a child. Mm. So... There's that and you, like that is 100% right. People, everyone, we all, all of us only do the best we can with the resources that we have available at the time. As we spoke about, was it last episode, episode, whatever. It was a couple of episodes ago when we're talking about how human beings are, like we're made to evolve, we're made to grow, we're made to mm. challenge ourselves, like all of those sort of things. So this is where this requisite has now been almost manipulated because one, it's a suppression. It can be used for suppression rather than a prerequisite for forgiveness. I imagine it's the person who wants forgiveness uses that as the line to yep. say, "I didn't know any better." Exactly. As though that's supposed to smooth things over. So yeah. just because it's true doesn't make everything well, go away and be swept under the rug. This is the thing as well. So, and this is the part that, like, you know, gets me is because when, y- if you say to you know your parents when you're an adult hey this is because you did this this is what I'm having to deal with now and then that parent goes oh I did the best I could um honey the fact that you've just said that means that you knew you weren't doing the best you could especially with that (laughs) energy right like there's a defensiveness to that it's like this is just distasteful just out of hand yeah so When that is used in its true por- formative sense, it is the the person who caused pain, which a lot of the times is the parent, wh- and not like not only the parent that caused the abuse, but the parent that did nothing about the abuse. Mm-hmm. Then it's when that parent goes, "You are right. I am so sorry. I, you know." I'm and glad you said it because there's a huge difference between "I'm sorry." Yeah. I did the best I could. Yeah. As opposed to I did the best, best I, I could. could. Like, like yeah. it's a massively different content. And that's ignoring the tonality and the energy behind it. Yeah. It's like it's the one's an acknowledgement, one's a, a deflection yeah. up to a point. And that's and then that's where it's like, well, yeah, that's it. You've just deflected. You've like, I did the best I could. No, you fucking didn't, sweetheart, mm. because if you've said that, it means that you knew you weren't doing the best you could. You knew you were in a shitty ass situation and you knew you wanted out. But can we can we give that a little bit of caveat to say yeah. it's the re- at at best it's a retrospective. Yeah, I know now that wasn't the best I could do. Yeah, like not not, not to justify anything, but it, it, it's still that conversation. Well, you fucking know now, but that that's almost the problem. You know now, and you still haven't said. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Or you still haven't said I've learnt. Or you still haven't said that wasn't right. Or, or you haven't fucking left. <laughs> yeah, that. Um, you know, so there's that. And then the other one is like I stayed for you or mm. I stayed for the kids. Mm. Like I didn't want to break the family up. Cool guilt trip. Like. Tama. Yeah, right? Yeah. And like uh, – you know, angry scale will come out because there's a part of me that's just like, no, you fucking didn't. 
You didn't stay for the kids. Well, before we press record, <laughs> the first thing that we were going to talk about was this exact thing we're saying now. And I sat there and I thought, yeah, we're both going to have something to say about this. And I think it's going to be roughly along the same lines of, yeah, yeah no, it wasn't. <laughs> exactly. Because, like, my own story um, is, like, my my father was incredibly physically abusive mm. to everybody in the house. He was emotionally abusive. Like, he was, uh, like, he's a narcissist, essentially. Mm. And, again, I don't tend to use that word lightly, um, but I have had conversations with him, like, in present day time, and, like, you know, he healed me and all this sort of stuff and I'm just going, oh, my fucking God, like, you honestly you just really don't seem to get it. Yeah. Um, so. <laughs> it could be argued that that's how you become a narcissist in the first place. You just don't, don't get, get it. Don't get it, right. Um, so he was incredibly physically abusive, um, emotionally abusive and also sexually abusive towards me. So mm. I was, like, sexually yeah. assaulted. The big three. Uh, the big three. <laughs> Trifecta. Tick. Yeah. Um, didn't want any money. No, fucker. Um, and then, and like all of us in that household were victims. So myself, my little one brother, way or the other, and my mum, all in one way or another. And I remember listening to an episode, and I can't remember who it was, but it was a beautiful psychologist that was saying it, and it was so true because when my parents finally divorced when I was fourteen, so. This abuse went on for 14 years of my life. Mm. And the straw that broke the camel's back was that my dad tried to screw someone else in our house. And, like, I went through a lot of anger or, or a lot of, like, you know, almost siding with my mum um, to the point where, I'm like, yeah, he's an asshole. He did this, he did that, he abused everyone, all of this sort of stuff, right? And I use that, like, oh, she only did, she only. She did the best she could with the knowledge she had available. But when I actually peel back the hurt and the layers, there was a lot of actual anger and hurt because, like, I can't remember if we've spoken about this on on air or we've just spoken about it, like... We have a lot of conversations <laughs> that are not recorded, guys. Um, and it starts to blur into one another <laughs> after a while. Right. Um, where it was like you had one fucking job and that was to protect your children and you didn't and you use the excuse I stayed for the kids till the point where something happened to your ego Mm -hmm. and that was the straw that says I can't do this anymore I'm out so (laughs) All of that to say, what happens if the necessity of which priority he finally messed with Mm. was what was the proverbial straw that broke the camel's back? Like trying to fuck someone else is not a straw, but you know what I mean. (laughs) But what if in her head she identified more strongly as an attractive, worthy woman than... As an integral mother. Did that make sense? So it was not until he's crossed the line that affected her in her concept of who she was as a woman, as mm. an attractive, viable, worthy partner. Yeah. Because that, in a way, was a higher priority than who she was as a mother and what she did or didn't do for her kids. Mm. And it wasn't until that was the line that was crossed that suddenly it's a whole new thing. Yeah. (laughs) That in no way, shape or form makes it okay because this is more of that she didn't know any better. But it's like if – because you've said some stuff about your mum previously to me Maybe. about your interpretations of her actions regardless of how and what she did yeah. in that relationship between your parents. Mm. 
And if what I've just said is even remotely the case, like it makes sense is to sort of describe this person as a more self-absorbed person. And it's not until it starts to mess with the ideas that you have and the ego around that self-absorption that it, it even crosses that bridge. Yeah. What if that's a mechanism of survival in those situations? Not because it's always that, but yeah. because it's, it's not until your own personal safety or your own sense of self is really genuinely messed with. Yeah. That you suddenly have the ability to pull back. Yeah. Does that make sense? It makes sense. It doesn't mean it's true. I'm just, I'm I, like, I'm trying to marinate in it and go, okay, is this right? And just like, like filter back through, oh, th you know, and. Th there's layers to it. Yeah. And there's a blending of all this sort of stuff. Yeah. So then you sort of start to question what she got taught. Well, I do know that. Sorry, in, in case yeah. it matters, you don't have to say <laughs> all okay. this stuff on air. Like I know you're cool with it, but yeah. it's like, like we're digging a bit. I know we're now. digging a bit. And that's cool. Um so I know that the relationship between my mom and my grandma, so her mom, was quite fractured as well. So mm -hmm. um, interesting segue because I was thinking about this the other day. Um, so my grandma was bipolar um, and never medicated. Uh, bless her heart, she's passed away now. Um, and she had a she had a prescription medication problem. Mm -hmm. So she medicated herself through. Um, like codeine and morphine and things like that. Yeah, that's how that works. Yeah, yeah right. She was also incredibly religious and mm -hmm. there is nothing wrong with religion. It's not about that. Um, but she was like quite fanatical, almost, you know, a bit fanatical. like Zealous. Zealous, over the top. Like to the point where pastors at her church were worried about her, essentially. So, like in terms of her calling them out on. This. No, in terms of her like thinking she was the voice of God and things like that. Welcome to my family, guys. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> good times. Um, <laughs> and so I know that their relationship was quite fractured, especially um, in her teenage years and all of that sort of stuff. Um, I do know, and I, I also did wonder this, so because I know my mum held on to a lot of anger and a lot of resentment towards gr uh, my grandma because um, she never got to have the chance to have a relationship with her father because her <laughs> father... What did you just hear? Yeah, right. Shush. <laughs> I know. Cool. Um, so apparently... My grandfather, who I've never met, by the way, my grandfather had an affair with my grandma before my mum was born. Um, and my grandma went, like, and this was when they were in England um, or just after my grandma, my mum was born because my mum was born in England. And so my grandma apparently went, no, screw you, I'm out, and grabbed her daughter and her son, so my uncle and my mum, and hopped on a plane back to Australia and went into her parents and my great-grandparents and, like, told the situation, welcome to generational trauma. And apparently my great-grandfather so pretty much said to my grandma, well, you're not staying it here doing nothing. You are going to work. So my grandma had to go get a job whilst my great-grandparents raised my mum. So there was a lot of resentment there because of that. Mm -hmm. I know that there was a lot of resentment there because, you know, uh, six months, a year later, whatever the case may be, um, my grandfather resurfaced and said, look, I'm so sorry, whatever the fucking case was, and wanted to try and make it work mm -hmm. for the family. Here is the quotation marks for the family. So he jumped on a plane back into Australia, but apparently because that wound was never healed, it was just projected on and projected on and projected on. And appar apparently this is all hearsay. I don't have facts. Unfortunately, my grandma has passed. I have no idea if my grandfather is still alive or not. Um, my grandma made my grandfather's life a living hell. 
like, you know, very in like yeah when we've got a wound especially when someone's gone and like you know had done an affair that. done that there's a wound there and if you don't heal said wound if you don't work on the trust issues and stuff like that they just fester and grow yeah. so to the point obviously where my grandfather was like i can't do this and left so apparently it was my grandma's fault that my mum never got to have a relationship with her father is that your mum's interpretation or what my, she was told my mum's interpretation of that uh, my grandfather has never made any sort of effort to know both of his children or his grandchildren. Okay. So it's... A bit going on there. Uh, right. Um, so I wondered, and like this is just my story alone, um, I wondered if maybe that was the reason that she stayed all of that time because of that resentment. As I said... You heard what you just said. I know, wrong. right. But <laughs> but this is the interesting part. Well, if that was the case, why why was it then my dad having an affair or trying to have an affair was the kicker? Would you like a theory? I'm always down for a theory. So you just described your grandmother as someone who seemed kind of fractured in their sense of self. She was a little bit unhinged, but... Apparently, but she was the most standard person with me. I love my grandma. <laughs> Good. What happens if the resentment and feeling state that your mum had about your grandmother mm. has led to a level of overcorrection? So there's a, a grandmother's a relatively fractured woman, like bipolar, gives her life to Christ and all this sort of stuff. So yeah. it, it, it's there's not much of a centeredness sounding <laughs> sense of herself. <laughs> And your mum saw that and went, well, I'm not being that bitch. And is overcompensated by being so definitively defined in her sense of self that it's not until said father challenges that sense of self Mm. that it like it's almost like this 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 rich, unhappy tapestry blended together of like this it's not until she gets cheated on and is like, oh, you saw what happened there. And it's like, like it, it's that straw that broke the camel's back. Yeah. But they had different ways of compensating for that. Yeah. Because if you are a recovering people pleaser. Oh, I'm a recovering people pleaser. I'm the black sheep. I'm the scapegoat. I'm that. <laughs> but, okay. <laughs> But what happens if that is at least preliminarily or at least initially until you've recognised it for what it is and have done the work, yeah. that is your overcompensation for your mum yep. being that relatively self-centred person that you've got to dis- like disperse your sense of self to look yeah. after everyone else, which okay. sounds like partially is what your grandmother did and it's like it's skipping – generations right it is giving and you're right because i like i was the people pleaser so um like from early as i can remember uh so let's like six especially um whenever my dad would go on to like a drunken rage and you know shit would get broken like like you just a picture of whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, I can imagine. <laughs> right. Um, I was th- I was a child and I was the human walking around the house the next day making sure everyone else was okay. Whilst no one asked me if I was okay. And so I was – I learned from a very young age that I was a parent as a child. So my role as a child was to nurture and, and you know, make sure everyone else was okay – At the expense of myself. If I said that generational curses basically boil down to inner child wounds and healing. 100%. So, because as you've just described, you've had a series of people who basically got told or or at least felt that they were not treated as they wished they were as a child. Mm-hmm. And by extension, there's this, uh, again, assuming I'm right, this overcompensation to manage said wounds that just inflict itch itself 
into maladaptive coping mechanisms for everyone after that. Yeah. Until the, the, cycle black, the black sheep. The cycle breaker over here. Yeah. Um, right. And that's it. And I, I found, like, you know, when I reflect back, looking back, at, I found that my mum, you know, was very dissociated. Mm. So was not present with actually what's happening now, which, again, is a survival mechanism and all of those sort of things. But, like, bringing it back, like, when we say, you know, and when they say, and, and like, my mum said it, I've had other people say it, I've had conversations with friends of being, like, Sky, like, you know, do you remember this person? And I was like, yeah. And they're like, okay, well, do you remember what was happening? And I'm like, yeah. And then, like, she was explaining to me, Almost exactly my own childhood. Like, you know, this woman had, you know, been in an abusive relationship that was off and on and had multiple kids and, you know, this drug addict human being was, like, beating the living crap out of her, beating the crap out of the kids. Human being is a pretty strong word for that. (laughs) Yeah, right. Fucking whatever. Goes to prison for, you know, being caught with drugs. And... As you do. uh, As you do. And this... And this woman, she's waited, she's stayed, she's waited. He gets out of prison and then, like, goes and has an affair and goes and cheats on her. And, again, that's the straw that breaks the camel's back. And I'm like, honestly, like, my brain is like, what the fuck are you doing? As wild as what I'm about to say is, why wouldn't he think he could fucking do that and get away with it? (laughs) He's done all this other wild shit and he's just, she's just stayed. And that's what I, and, and I think you're right, like... Yeah, even with my dad, even with the other people that I've spoken to, like, well, of course they're going to do whatever the fuck they want because they've There's got no consequences. They, they've gotten away with it. They've managed to talk people around or, you know, say something, never happen again, fucking wank, um, and all that sort of stuff. But then again, it's like, oh, I tried so hard and I stayed for the kids. No, you fucking did it. <laughs> like, what part of that? Is for the kids, though. You stayed to placate your inner child. Yeah. Which is the only way that kids actually seem to be genuinely relevant in this conversation. Mm. It's like, oh, it, one rule means that it's fine to stay. One rule means that, no, I'm out. Yeah. And you're like, no, 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 no. It's, just, it's not until someone really messes with that idea of, Self and this this is why I was sort of like wondering and sort of mulling over. It's like in, it's not until that sense of self is genuinely messed with because mm. that's then the inner child really f- fucking firing up. Yeah, it's one thing to watch it happen to other kids; it's another thing to happen to you. And you're like, that's a pretty <clears throat> yeah. How did that wo- feel? <laughs> wounded way of looking at it. <laughs> yeah, but you you f- and I guess this is the only way they didn't know any better is actually relevant. It's like you forgot that there were other kids having their own inner child wounded because you were so preoccupied with your own until such times as they just – that bell end who was doing all this wild shit just hit the right enough wound Mm. for you to finally get angry about something. Yeah. That. That. Mm. You took your glasses off and you are suddenly a dramatically <laughs> different looking woman. I have no makeup on. Like you were one of the very few people besides my husband that sees me without makeup. Go me. <laughs> Go me. But no, my glasses were hurting my ears with my headphones. I was like, I can't do I, this I had anymore. assumed that was what was happening. I was, I was like, like <laughs> surely they're not your glasses. They just hurt your head all the time. No. Um, my... Uh, <laughs> My blue blocking glasses that I, I like, so I don't need them to see or anything. Yeah. Um, they protect my eyes from things. Mm. <laughs> Damn. So, like, picking that apart, and like, as you said, like, for the kids is, you know, really the only reasoning is because of their own inner child wounding. The other reasons we're about to come up with yeah. will, will be on some level child orientated. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, which 
I can sort of I can I can sort of understand it because I have an inner child and I had a wounded inner child as well. Um, yeah, that would also sort of lead into like the shadow, mm. essentially. Well, I. I when I even for myself when I do um, shadow integration shadow work with clients, I inner child is a part of that, you know, because that is still a part of you that you've put where, into the darkness. Where do you, I was about to say, like, where do you think you stuff that <laughs> poor little kid that's got bruises all over it? Yeah. I'm not looking at that little kid. That's me. Ew. Ugh. Right. Um, but a lot of the times, yeah. So. It's not essentially, as you said, like for the kids, for external. It's still for self. Even if it's Mm. for your own inner child, that's for self. Especially if you're in a place where you're ignoring your children's plight. What does that mean? Challenges, difficulties, uh, hardships. Let's talk about the woman that got diagnosed with ADHD at the age of 35. <laughs> Nothing wrong with not knowing what a word means. It's not the point. But it, it's like if no, you're... that's what I mean. Like if you're a mother, if you're a reasonable human being, yeah, I don't think it's much of a stretch to imagine that the vast majority of them would want to have a child's welfare as a central part of how they go about their business. Yeah. Which says something about exactly how profound the wounds that they're currently so preoccupied with to ignore that. Exactly. I call them narcissistic wounds because, well, that's what, you know, wounds do. Yeah. It drives you to a level of self-absorption that it's, if it's profound enough, it compels you to ignore everything else in front of you. Yeah. That's what it looks like to me. Uh, Yeah, and I think you'd be about right because obviously, you know, you guys have heard a part of my story but, like, I did leave out massive chunks because they are not mine to tell. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And, like, even as a witness to those parts, I'm still, like... So... (laughs) Like, there's... There's a retrospective description of World War II. Mm -hmm. You know how Switzerland declared itself neutral? Yes. There were some post-war commentators that that, 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 I think it's the famous line is to declare neutrality in the face of oppression is to be a silent supporter of oppression. Right. And I think ultimately this whole episode is that. That. Yeah, I'm Switzerland. I call neutral. I'm not getting involved. Yeah, with your kids being abused. You know, with or with my own kids getting abused. I'm that, not. You that's know. what I mean. It's like, you know, yeah. no, 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 no. Gen- like Jewish, gen- like I don't, I don't see anything. Jewish yeah. genocide, kids abused. Like, blah 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 blah. Yeah, exactly. Like la la la. Stick my fingers in my ears and yeah. all of that sort of stuff. Ostrich right? that shit. And you're right because I think whether it was the last episode. Or, again, it's something that we've spoken about off air that we haven't actually spoken about on air. Yet. Yet, because, you know, that's the thing. Um, I'm pretty sure it was like the last episode, part one, um, where I was talking about like when men witness, you know, Mm. abuse happening to women, you know, inappropriate behaviour and all that sort of stuff and they don't do anything about it, they don't intervene and they go, oh, that's my mate, I can't do that. Like that's essentially, yeah, I call neutral, I'm not, you know. Yeah, you it, are it's it's the dodgy male equivalent of I couldn't leave for the kids. It's, yeah. not, it's not the same but it's that same rationality. Right, it's that like I'm not getting involved, you know, not my, mm. like not my circus, not my monkeys type thing. But in this situation it is your circus and it's your fucking monkeys. Like... <laughs> You are alive and you live in a society. It is always your fucking circus and it is always your fucking monkeys. Yeah. And frankly, as I hopefully made my point extremely clear in the last episode, if you are any kind of self-respecting man, yeah. I would expect you to think that too. Right. This is your world. Mm. Why wouldn't you want it to be as safe and as peaceful and prosperous a place as possible? Yeah, that's it. And that's just society at large. Alone, you fucking 
family. Anyway. Yeah. And I think that's the topic we're going to cover for the next episode. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so, yeah, drawing back, like, playing that new, neutral space, like, I, you know, not getting involved, whatever the case may be. Like, part of me is just like, no wonder why we have so many wounded adults walking around. <laughs> You're alive, <laughs> you're going to pick up a wound here or there. <laughs> right. You mentioned before I went into tangent land about circus and monkeys. Circus, circuses and How monkeys. How much sleep have you got, Scott? <laughs> <laughs> I had a decent sleep. <laughs> Fuck off. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> my amazing brain ro- like works way too quick for my mouth. Oh, don't worry, I do it all the time. <laughs> like, I was trying to describe that dude in Nightmare on Elm Street, but he's Freddy Frueger. <laughs> Idea. Um, you mentioned that there was other reasons. Mm-hmm. Like, what are you thinking? Do you want a verbatim list? Uh, yeah, sure. Why not? Nowhere to go. Yep. Have no money. Yep. What will people think? Yeah, that's a big one. What will my kids think? Is he going to come after me? Yep. Just as a casual four or five ish list. Just a four or five ish list, yes. But the depth of which those go into. Mm. So, like, I've got nowhere to go, which effectively boils down to the rationalization of where am I going to take my kids? Yes. I've got no money. Uh-huh. I have no financial means. Yep. How am I going to feed my kids? Mm-hmm. What if it comes after us? Mm-hmm. How am I going to, if he's the dude who will do that? Yeah. How am I going to physically defend my kids? Mm. So, and those are all very valid and logical reasons. Like, and again, if you want to go into tangent land on like finances and stuff, why do you think so many women have stepped into their masculine role right now? <laughs> um, like again, like like as I said at the start of this episode, like the women I speak to, because a lot of them are healing from toxic relationships, from abusive relationships because they've grabbed their kids and they're like, fuck this shit, I'm out. Mm. And they are doing everything within their power to provide and, you know, nurture and all of the things. They have no real choice in the matter at that point. No, it's just, it's what has to happen. It, it Exactly, it's what has to happen. And um, yeah, so they are, you know, either working full-time, working like whatever the social means and all that sort of stuff is. So there's that. Um, and having a oh, – I don't know about where else anyone else is listening to, but I, I'm like I know presently there is a rental crisis in this fucking country right now. It's rough out there. Uh, um, and, and if, if you're anything like me and you grew up in that environment – There's not many like you, mate. <laughs> Take that as the compliment and weird backhander that it is. <laughs> um, like, yeah, so if you grew up in an environment that I similarly grew up in, like, you know, going back, going back to, you know, that, going back to my parents and all that sort of stuff, that's like, no, that's not going to happen. Mm. Um, I'll leave in my car first. And, like I obviously I can only see things through my own lens and my own model of the world um but I was I know for me I was very cautious about who I <laughs> who I bred with who I had kids with <laughs> that sounds so bad um it's accurate but it <laughs> right uh <laughs> makes you sound like you're on a <laughs> you're on a ranch somewhere but anyway uh. <laughs> that was you saying it this time not right. me <laughs> My poor husband when he listens to this episode because he does listen to my episodes. <laughs> Here comes Guy. What Stop, AJ. <laughs> guy, what the fuck? Um, <laughs> no, but like I, I, I think I've ever mentioned it. I, I had lots of conversations around parenting. I had lots of conversations around what would happen. Like I very much prepared, you know, I, I was – but I was also in that stage of awakening and healing, not so much like had kids and then going, hang on a minute here, it's this is not what I want. It's valuable stuff. Right, um, you know, so like finances wise and I'm not here to tell anyone what to do or what not to do or anything like that but 
people that I've worked with in the past, people that I've spoken to in the past and all that sort of stuff, um, if you are in this style of relationship, and it's not even a fucking relationship, it's a situation, um, a not a great one, always, always, always have a backup plan. Like, even if that is, like, somehow transferring money to a friend, it's, you know... Hopefully the right friend. Ho- hopefully the right friend. Yes, have someone you can trust. Um, I know I've had um, – and a lot of the times, so with these personality types, and they're quite narcissistic, right, they, they don't want to have their cover blown, essentially. Isn't that narcissist 101? Right. So nine times out of ten now, you know, this is obviously not – like there's always an exception to rules. There's always like percentages. There's always things because nine times out of ten, if you are able to get out or if you do leave until they get (laughs) their next victim, that doesn't sit. It's true. But it's true, right? They don't tend to come after you because that means exposing themselves. Yes and no. There's a reputation destruction conversation to have. There's a concern. Again, it's like what will people say if she tells people what actually happened? Right. So a lot of the times these people will actually, unfortunately, you know, badmouth you to... Preempt the conversation. Preempt the conversations and stuff like that. <laughs> Fun times we're all. The we're first story is the one that most people remember. Yeah, um, yeah, a lot of the times we, a lot of people are awake to that now, which is fantastic. Mm. Um, and a lot of the times the the coming after you is through, and I know this also through personal experience, um, through my, you know, narcissistic ex, is they will come after you. In a non-physical form. So I got bombarded with text messages. I got bombarded Mm -hmm. with calls. I got bombarded with abusive voicemails. All of those sort of things. And it's... It's relatively deniable. Yeah. Whereas if you go up and just give her a belting, like it's... It crosses... I'm about to say what I'm about to say. It crosses a line that is so evidenced that there is no denying it. There is no getting around mm. it. There is no describing it, oh, no, she's crazy, I'm fine. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. And like as you said, it's relatively deniable. It is and it isn't because... I, like, it's still bloody evidence. You've still got the text message. Right, but there, like there's the nothing dumb. compared to a big picture of a fucking black eye, right. for example. You know, and the idiot is going to leave a you know, abusive ass voice messages or text messages and it's just like, well, you're a fucking idiot, aren't you? Like, oh, no, I wasn't abusive. I'm not the crazy person but here's like a, you know, a massive list of me, you know, calling all sorts of names and and threatening all sorts of things to do and all of that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, are you a bit simple? Um, They kind of are. And... The, the the fun thing is and like this was like this was a realization I had not too long ago in regards to social media and it applies like everywhere and I was talking to my mentor about this and like I I wouldn't and I'm just gonna be completely honest I wouldn't actually sit there and talk about this sort of stuff on social media because I didn't want to get the abuse held at me. I didn't want to start wars and I didn't want to do all this sort of stuff. But I also know that talking about this stuff is super important and super valuable because I grew up in uh, an environment where you didn't talk about what happened behind closed doors, which is like narcissism control 101, right? And that's how things become deniable. It's how it's his word against hers and, and, Mm -hmm. and vice versa. So I'm a massive, massive advocate for having these conversations um, because they shed light to the skeletons and closets and shadows and all that sort of stuff. Um, and I was talking to my mentor about it and she's like, well, why are you not doing it? You need to be having this conversation. This is what you're about. And I'm like, I know, but, you know, that like 
fear mentality, people pleasing mindset sort of kicks in. I'm like, I don't want to upset anyone. Um, and she was like, Sky, you are 100% in control. And I was like, what do you mean? And he goes, okay, you put something out on the internet. We get that. I said, but you can turn comments off. You can block people. You can. And I was like, when that. You can regulate the information yeah, you put in it. Like, and I was like, when that, when that hit, I was like, oh, you're right. And. I've even relayed this to clients who have been like getting really affected by crazy ass narcissistic ex partners that are like, you know, going on a war path one day. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, you are in complete control. And, you know, she'd be like, what do you mean? I'm like, you do not have to answer. You like, you can block, you can delete numbers, you can direct co- like communication especially when there's children involved because I think that's a lot of the times a hard thing is when there's children involved, there always has to be a line of communication open. Especially if it's court ordered. Right, exactly. Especially when there's like custody agreements and all that sort of stuff. I said, but you can regulate where that communication goes and you can, you know, monitor it. It doesn't even have to go to you. It can go to a third party. And the same thing, when that really resonated with her, it was like like power had come back and when we think that one we have nowhere to go there's always somewhere if we think that there's no finances or you know um i can't because of xyz or whatever else as i said like always have it out and stuff like that Mm. there is always a way there is always a way for you to be in control and no support um well, we spoke about that in the last episode when we come about like, you know, all of those sort of support options and stuff like that. But even when we think, because I feel like a lot of as, like a lot of people, when they say no support and like fucking hands up, I was one of them. We always talk about our family. Like my family are not supportive and nine times out of ten, I've had conversations with clients that have had their parents go, what are you doing leaving? Go back to where you belong. And I'm like, can I fucking stab you? Like really? Like like, seriously. (laughs) But it's (sighs) – it's just – So then there's that lack of support from their parents or their family and – Even still, I was one of them. As I said in the last episode, I was fucking told not to bring children home and all of that sort of stuff. So we have that idea of like no support means... (laughs) Which point is not home. That's (sighs) not the word for it. Right. Um, That it's our family. But there's always... Like there's always someone. Like you, for example, you know, like I know... You've said to me before, it's like, oh, if you're having trouble with the boys or if you bring them here, bring them here. My my best friend is the same, and she's a, like, she is a single mom who, like, you know, will relate to all of this shit that I'm saying. And I'm not going to share her story personally because I don't have permission for that. But she is a fucking epic woman. Um, she's just like, Sky, if you need a break, you know, like, mm. bring them over. And I'm like doing this by yourself like what the fuck but um, and i'm the same like hey babe if you need a break bring bring Mm. my goddaughter over it's fine um you know like they can all play so like branch out of (laughs) you've got to have those friends who are present enough with it who are understanding without judging Mm. Because I, I imagine that whether it's a projection or whether it's you've literally just been told, don't bring your fucking kids home. <laughs> but I imagine that's the thing that feels like no support. Yeah. And you're like, I hope that you've anyone who is listening, who is in the middle, is like they, they do have that friend that just it's not interested in judging. Like, no, I'm just here on Team Sky or, or wh- whoever it happens yeah. to be. Mm. So what, what does that look like? Mm. But it's that perception of judgment, like that thing we said about, oh, what do people say? Yeah. It, like, is it a rationalisation? Is it a justification? Is it is it a a method by which you you feel judged by you 
and you imagine everyone else does it, so asking for help and actually receiving help, regardless of how that other person has or hasn't spoken to you about this as a subject, mm. it is its own prison within itself and it is, is its own cut off of potential outreach. Yeah. And even when people sort of say, if you're having a rough one, mate, bring, bring the kids over. Mm. Like, well, we're drinking Morty for two hours or something like that. Angry beavers. Uh, <laughs> even better. <laughs> Yeah, and that's it. And I, and I was going to say as well, like with the parent thing, mm-hmm. because that for the vast majority of people is the most prominent version of what support is supposed to look like. Right. When yeah. you don't have it, because you don't have that central focal point of support, almost none of the rest matters. Yeah. It's very hard to see the forest for the trees. That. And and that's where I mean like by broadening and looking outward because like as you said, there's anyone that I've ever spoken to that has been in similar situations or the same situations or, you know, whatever the case may be and that unfortunately is a very, very high fucking percent, they, they can recount at least one person that was – always there and even if it like even with my best friend for example like I was that one person Mm. the the fucking stupid excuse for a flesh suit thing that sperm donor yeah that right um had initially like managed to have her isolate herself enough and it wasn't a case of you know um like she wasn't allowed to go out and see people but it was a case of like you know which is again everyone could see what was happening mm. it was fucking visible it wasn't behind closed doors it wasn't it was visible and if you, look if you know what you're looking for it's always visible yeah Sorry, um it just is yeah exactly it's whether you want to see it or not and they were just – a lot of the people in her life were just like, I can't watch you destroy yourself. I'm going. You know, there's a previous episode before where we've talked about the balance between sort of sitting there and being present and giving someone time to yeah. wake up to themselves and there's another thing to go, I am needing to preserve my own right. peace. That's it. <sighs> I get why someone would say that. 100% because it's, you know, there's only, well, there's only so many times like a, a friend or, a you know, anyone really can hear the same story and mm. go and then the friend go, you need to leave. Yeah. You need to get out. And then the person's like, oh, no, it's okay. It's not that bad. Um, right. I and just, uh, yeah, I've. And that is part one of this epic conversation with Sky and Todd. Make sure you subscribe so you can catch part two when it lands. Be good, be kind, be your best self and no bar fights.